Thank you, Jesus. I praise you, God. You're more than worthy. Graciousness, kindness, goodness, mercy are from you, my God. Thank you, Lord. I um, hardly know where to uh, begin tonight. I know where I want to go, but... Uh, there's so many little things I left off last week uh, talking about where Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, the time has come, is coming, and now is. I love that statement, now is. When Jesus says now, he means now. He doesn't mean someday in the future, he means now. Now is that those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And the key ingredient in all of that is the fact that God is spirit. And um, we must worship him in spirit. I, I, I um, think we sometimes could look for some present synonyms of that, but uh, I, one could be one could be for spirit. A synonym for spirit is right attitude. Um, God would like, when, when we go to worship him, we must worship him with the right attitude and the right mindset and, and go after him with our, that's, that's the biggest area, every one of our hearts, our ideas. Those that, those that seek God should seek him with their whole heart. And uh, I find that that's far more easy to say than it is to do. Because you find in your process of seeking him, there's all kinds of things of life that interfere. They get in the way. There's thoughts that get in the way. And we, we uh, hardly remember uh, how to get out of the the stuff we get ourselves involved in in everyday life and realize that God was, is far beyond that. If we could only understand that God is the miracle maker. I was, uh, I was reminded of today, I was, uh, I, I was on Facebook with Edna Kavanaugh. How many remember Edna when she came here years ago and, and, and preached to us? But she... She showed a picture of back in the days when A. A. Allen was still alive, and she was in a meeting, and Brother Allen prayed for a lady who weighed over 500 pounds. And when he began to pray for her that God would help her lose weight, she, while she stood on the platform, she lost so much weight, her dress started to fall off. Wow. And they had to hold her up and within the next week, she lost another 190 pounds. And I thought, I thought, Lord, those are the kind of things that we need to shake us. Because we as the church, whether we want to admit it or not, we're basically asleep to the dimension of the supernatural of God, the spiritual aspect of God. We just, we just get enough to keep us satisfied and and God wants to get us to a place, the song that Peter was, was uh, singing that, that uh, set us on fire to the point where there's a burning within us that we're, we're not satisfied with what we're experiencing. I don't know about you, but, but uh, God's been more than good to me over these years, and he's blessed, Amen. and he's taken care of us. You know, he's taken you... He's taken me through things. He's taken you through things. 
But the issue is, my heart longs for more. My heart longs for a deeper, greater experience. And, and I, I'm reminded a lot about Paul, that, that Paul said to the Philippian church, after all those years and all the things he'd gone through, it, it would do every one of us good to read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 over and over and over again and see what Paul went through just to serve Christ. And then he would turn around at the end of that and write to the Philippian church that I might know him. Yeah. You think sooner or later, St. Paul, the high and only bishop of the Gentiles, that's what we do. But that isn't what Are you, are, you, are you listening to me? And, and all of that, and he said that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, that reality that takes us beyond all of that. So I said all of that because there was so much that's here in John. And uh, I, don't know, I don't know how this is going to get me to the hard sayings of Jesus. So this is where I started. But the issue is there's so much that takes us there because we got Jesus himself walking in human frame and trying to upset the whole religious system that then was. Are you listening? He was turning over the whole religious system. He was trying, they were looking for him and he was there. And they didn't know who he was. They were experts, the scribes and the Pharisees. They were experts at the scriptures. They had it all figured out. The scribes had the scriptures. Remember where it says about jots and tittles? Those were little numberings that they put on. And, and, and when they wrote down the scriptures, each number, each letter had a number, and if they didn't total up to a certain thing, they had a number out of place, or a word out of place, or something was out of place. They had it down pat, but they didn't find him. And what is the important thing for every one of us is that we really find him we really experience him and and one thought i i just had this thought we've we've had a lot of experiences we've had them in the past you've had them i've had them but i want to tell you what are they up to date that's what god's interested in. he's not interested in yesterday what he's interested in is are you up to date with him are you on time with him are you are you experiencing what he wants or is there an emptiness inside of you that you're afraid to admit because if you're afraid to admit it you're not going to get anything but if you agree with God and you say all right Lord that's what I want that's what I'm looking for that's what I'm longing for then he can begin to answer your cry. He can begin to answer what you want and fulfill it. Amen? Amen. Well, praise God. I said all of that. Where am I going to start, Lord? Well, let me see here. Anyway, I, I just want to give you a couple thoughts. So let's turn to John 4, okay? And um, let's jump down to about verse 27, something like that. He had already finished uh, uh, talking to the Samaritan woman, and she took off heading for town. She was out at the well, remember? And she turned around, and she headed for town. And when she headed for town, she went into town and, and probably into the marketplace area where the market where everybody is gathered. And she went in there, and she, she met all the men in town, and they knew her. Remember, she had five husbands. She's on number six. And they knew who she was. And then she starts 
talking to them about a man who told her everything about her life. Okay? And so they, as we go down through the chapter, uh, in the meantime, while she's in town, he starts talking to the disciples. Okay? And um, let's start, let's, let's jump, um, verse 30. And they went out of the city and came to him, and in the meantime his disciples said to him, Rabbi, eat, or teacher, eat. And he said, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Now, now, this is crazy. Remember last week we talked about the money they had? And they went to town to buy food. How would you like to go fight, buy food for your teacher to feed him? You're serving the guy, and, and you, bring him, you bring him his dinner, and he says, well, I don't want it. I've already got food to eat. And you, you, you were like them. They were probably start looking around saying, hey, man, where did he get this food? Okay. And therefore the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? And Jesus said to them, my food, here's the key, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. I could stop here and talk for a while. How many times have you ever got started in in something you never finished. I was known for that. I was an expert at that. I could get projects started like crazy and some, some other project would come in and it'd come up on the important list above the one that was already started and you'd, you'd leave that and say, I'll get to that. That's not quite as important. I, I gotta take care of this project over here. But Jesus said, I came with one purpose. One purpose only is to do his will and to finish it. Are, are, you, are you listening? Okay. And do you not say there is still four months and then comes the harvest? And behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields for they are already white for harvest. Now, I believe, I believe there's a, a real understanding, there's a real teaching here that goes beyond, but uh, I believe that the church primarily has misinterpreted what Jesus has said here. He said in his day, it was already to finish what he had come to do. Are you all right? And when you talk about harvest, how many know you don't sow and the next day you go harvest? It has to go through its season. It has to go through its time. And I believe what he was really saying was the preparation was already laid. And John the Baptist was really, if you go down through here and do a teaching, John the Baptist was the seed sower and he went out and prepared the way. And then Jesus came on the scene. Okay. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look, for they are already white for harvest. And he, he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Isn't that amazing? The wages that come isn't just to the reaper. The wages that come are shared with the sower. For in this is saying is true, one sows and another reaps. And I send you to reap for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. That's amazing. I, I, I remember years ago, and, and some of us may know and some of us may not know. But let me ask you this. Who was it prayed for you to bring you into an understanding of the Lord. Who sowed? You just didn't get here by accident. Somebody sowed. And so many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word of the woman. This is, an awesome, this is a great this is a great story here. If, 
if you really understand. She goes and tells all these people, and they're saying, oh, man, let's go meet this guy. I wonder what the condition of their city was. Couldn't have been too great. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and, there, and he stayed two days. Isn't that amazing? He stayed two days. Now remember, he was on a three-day journey. He was, he, was, he, he was going to Jerusalem for the feast, all right? It was a three-day journey. And he was already walked six hours of one day. Are, are you listening? He'd already walked six hours. He was tired. He sat down at noon of one day. And he only had six more hours he could walk that day. And these guys showed up, and they convinced him to stay two days. How many of you, oh, I shouldn't say that, because I know I hate being delayed. One of, the, one of the things I hate the most in life is being late. I hate being late. I hate waiting till the last minute to leave. I'm, I, I'll, I'll guarantee you, I don't, I don't walk by the mirror on the way out the door and make a decision whether I like what I got on or not. So I have to change my mind. I, I, are, you, are you listening to what I'm saying? But Jesus up and stayed two days. And many more believed because of his report. And they said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, but because of what, for, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. I'm going to stop here for a minute. Lord, how am I going to do this and hit the point down at the end? But that's, that's the goal. I, I, was, I was taking a look in, in uh, Exodus, in the 20th chapter, and uh, God called Moses up into the mountain, okay? You got these people, they went 70 down into Egypt, and there's two and a half million coming out. And uh, they come out, and uh, they get over... They get over by Sinai and uh, another place called Horeb. But th they get over there, and God's been talking to Moses. You know, and every time Moses goes talk to God, he, he lights up like a candle. And, uh, and, and so then Moses, God tells Moses, you go get the people ready. You tell them what they got to do, because I'm going to come down on this mountain, and I'm going to talk to them. I want to talk to them. My people, I think I ought to be able to talk to them. And um, so Moses goes up and talks to God, and God gives him the, the commandments, and they, he talks to them, tells them what they are. And, and then um, the mountain, you know, the mountain starts on fire, and there's all kinds of stuff happens, you know, there, and and that whole thing. So Moses goes down to people and says, are you ready? God wants to talk to you. And guess what they said? We don't want to hear him. You go talk to him. You go talk to him. And I got thinking like this. They believed Moses, but they didn't want to listen to him. And the whole idea we had here was the fact them, that lady went in there into that town, followed the same pattern all the way through, and it so lit them up inside. They said, we want to meet that guy. We want to hear what he's got to say. Same God that was up on that mountain with Moses. Had the opportunity 
And so they said, we want to go hear him. I want to ask you, how many of you and I, not, 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 don't raise your hand and don't feel guilty, but how many of you want to go into a dimension of God and hear the voice of God beyond what I've told you or anybody else? Now, I've heard some good preachers in my lifetime. I've heard some deep preaching. But I want to tell you what. There's something that longs inside of me to hear God's own voice. It's got to have a ring to it. It's got to have a sweetness to it. It's got to have... When, when, when Jesus began to talk, you know what they said? They had nothing to say because nobody talked like he talked. Nobody shared like he shared. Nobody, nobody could begin to talk because everything else is just frivolous and, and earthy and all that. But when he began to talk, when he began to speak, there was something about it. And these men said, not only do we believe because that prophet has told us, we believe now because we've heard him for ourselves. And that is, I want you to know that's my goal for you. That's my goal, that you hear the voice of God. That you quit sometimes the frivolous thinking that we get. The stuff we talk about so lightly. Because we forget that God has offered us something far more than just going to church. We got this whole thing upside down about dying and going to heaven and all that. I don't have a problem with that, but I want to tell you something. He still says that death is an enemy. I don't know about you, I want to hear the voice of God that says, here, you can overcome this. He said about it, fear not. You're in this world, you're going to have all kinds of testing trials. You don't have testing trials, you're not in the world. You're, you're out of space someplace. You're going to have testings. You're going to have trials. You're going to have sicknesses. You're going to have it. You're going to have it. You're going to have it. But he said, fear not, I've overcome it. Well, I'll tell you what, all they got to do is tell you you got to see things and fear rises up into you till you're paralyzed in your ability to have faith. I want you to hear God. These men got to a place where they went to see Jesus and they heard what he had to say. And you know what they said? We know that you're the Christ. You're what the whole world, you're not the Antichrist. You're not the maybe Christ. You are the Christ. You're the deliverer, the savior of the world. You're going to deliver us. It isn't this just churchanity. It's this whole thing. You've come to change everything that human beings live at. You're the, you're the savior of the world. I'll bet you those guys, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to preach and I, I'm going to go on. I bet you those guys were never the same. You want to know why? Because they found out who he really was. That's what every one of us need. We need to find out who he is. Now after two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee. So he came back to right where he started. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So Galilee was his country. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what they'd be saying about him? Oh, we, we, know, we know who he is. Remember what his mother was? 
Hmm. They weren't even married, and she was like this. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. That's a principle. So when he came to Galilee, you know, that's sometimes, why did I think that? I'm going to tell you what. That's, what. that's what kids think about parents, especially when they get to be teenagers. The hormones start to work. It changes the whole way they think. They think mom and dad don't know nothing. And then they get about 30 and get a couple of kids of their own, and then they say, oh, my God, they were right. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they had also gone to the feast. So some people see and believe, some people hear and believe. So Jesus came again to Cana. Now, isn't this good? Remember what happened in Cana? You remember back in chapter 3 what happened in Cana? Turned the water into wine? It wasn't time yet, but he turned the water into wine. There was a few people that were there, but the rest didn't believe. So here he is. He came to Cana of Galilee where he had made water wine, and there were certain noblemen whose son was sick. There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Capernaum was just over from Cana. And when he had heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. I, I wonder sometimes where we're at in that dimension today. I just wonder where we're at. I think it's a necessary thing. Look at me. Talk to me. I think it's necessary. I think it's necessary in my life. I think it's necessary in your life. We need to expect, not think maybe, but we need to expect the miraculous to be in our life. When Mark wrote his gospel, he said it this way. These signs, these signs shall follow them that believe. What kind of signs is that? Whatever is necessary. Jesus wasn't planning to go down and heal this guy it just happened to come along. Now remember, he's on a three-day journey and he's already late. Reminds me of the story he was on his way to heal the daughter of Jana and the woman with the issue of blood showed up. And the noble said, said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. You know, I, I was, I was, I've thought about this a half a dozen. This is just the way we're made, whether we like it or not. When it's happening to us or our kids or our family or something, I mean, it occupies our whole mind. We can't think of anything else. That just shows us how, I almost said self-centered, we are. But the issue is when it's our kids, our stuff, our... This guy was willing to, to upset the, the greatest teacher that the planet had ever seen at that time just to get him to go to his house. 
You ain't got time to go down there and do whatever you're doing. You got to come to my house. It's all about me and my house. And Jesus said, go your way. Your son lives. Now the Bible says, at least Paul wrote it this way in Philippians, he said that Jesus emptied himself of all deity. He emptied himself, being shaped like a man. Say, Jesus was just like me without the sin. Can I say that again? Say, Jesus, just like me, without the sin. Whatever gave him the idea that he could just declare that that child was well, and it happened, sure enough, because he'd just gone through a whole, no, no, it's the next chapter. He goes through this whole thing and says, I can't do anything with myself. Unless I see my father doing it, I can't do it. Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. God, just help me, Jesus. And as he was now going down to his servants, met him and said, your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better, and they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So, remember Jesus who was a half a day, okay? Half a day, stayed that day and two more days. This is the day he's supposed to be somewhere else. He's already past noon. He's past lunchtime. It's seventh hour. The fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. Say, Lord, Lord I want to walk so much like you when I declare deliverance into someone's life. It happens. Not for my honor, not for my glory, not that I get a name. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he come out of Judea, of Galilee. So in other words, the first one was the Cana, First sign, second sign, second sign was he healed this nobleman's son. And that was to bring Galilee, gather Galilee in to understand he was the Christ. And after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and the Jews went up to Jerusalem. They always went up to Jerusalem for the church. Every gathering they went. I wish church people would come to church every gathering we had. They want all the benefits without the... Oh, I shouldn't say that. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in the Hebrew Bethsaida, having five porches. I love this story. I, I, how would you like to have, how would you like to have a, a, a little pond out here, you know? You got this little pond out here in the field, okay? And uh, once a month, an angel comes down and stirs up the waters. And every time an angel comes down and stirs up the waters, if you're the first half a dozen in, you're healed. Can you imagine what kind of a zoo this would be? You'd need more than five porches. I, 
How many remember uh, Richard Patnaw, uh, our friend Richard? I remember Richard telling me in, in, a, in the mid-80s, maybe about the time we first came here, in the mid-80s, um, their, son had, their son had died, got killed in an accident. And uh, in the meantime, they got involved with some charismatic Catholics. And I forgot the guy's name. Maybe you can remember, but I forgot his name. He's over in Worcester. He was a Catholic priest over in Worcester. Did, yeah, that's, that's the guy. Anyway, he was over in Worcester. And uh, every Friday, he'd have healing night. Say, an angel would show up. And it got so big that they used to have to get this, the, the hockey arena, the, what do they call it, Stephen, now? The Civic Center in Worcester. Huh? Anyway, they, they'd have to get that auditorium for his Friday night meetings because they'd be so many people. We used to live next door to uh, Gino's church. On Friday night. And I remember cars being like, you couldn't park in front of the house. And I just wondered what would happen. All we need here is one or two miracles. Oh, Jesus, help me now. You know, we, 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 we want that stuff. But we don't understand what a responsibility it would put on us as a people. I'll never forget when Fran and, and Irene and them all went to Brownsville. And they, and they talked about, oh, how much good time they had in the parking lot and fellowshipping with all the people and the meetings and da -da -da -da, the whole thing. And then they get in the church and the whole thing and that. And, uh, What's his name? John, whatever his name was, I forgot. Anyway, they brought a tape home, and I'm listening to this tape, and he starts talking about, well, we had all these people, and we, and we, had, to, we had to borrow money to get enough toilet paper, because last month we used 15,000 rolls of toilet paper. And I thought, oh, my God. How many of us could we get to go in and start putting toilet paper? I mean, you'd put one in and have to go get the other one to put in. That means that the people in the local assembly were working. And they were given and partaking. Are you all right? How did I get there? But it's a good thought. It may take up some of our time, our precious time. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. The Jews went up in Jerusalem. You know, we got the pool at Bethsaida. Having five porches, and there lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. That's just like the church. I think the church is waiting for the next moving of God. I heard, I heard Sister Fran, she was on the phone today with somebody. I'm not sure who it was. She was on, on, the, on the phone with somebody. And, and, and she said something about the people are waiting for a stirring. God said, God said, stir yourself.
stir yourself. We're waiting for God to do. We're waiting for God to do a lot of things, and God's waiting for us to do it so He can empower us to get it done. He's already here. Say, God is in a waiting mode, waiting for us to move in faith to do a miracle. Okay. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whosoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water, help me, Jesus, I'm just about done. And I never got to where I wanted to get. It's down in this fifth chapter, but that's okay. An angel went down at a certain time in the pool and stirred up the water when whosoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water. Now, I don't know. If, if you're sick, lame, paralyzed, and you got to be first in the water. How are you going to get there? I, you know, I mean, we hope the tide don't rise, or maybe it does, but we got to get close to that water. The stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. I got thinking about this, bud. So we know the guy's at least 38 years old. He's at least. It doesn't say he had it since the time he was born. It said he's just had this infirmity for 38 years. So we'll just throw another 10 on it and say he's close to 50. Okay. But he's been hanging out at this pool for 38 years. Can you say he's a regular at every revival meeting? And when Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he already had been in that condition a long time. And he said to him, do you want to be made well? Now, you've you got to listen to these words. You got to listen to these words. Do you want to be made well? I got a question for all of us. Me, you, everybody else. Do we want to be in a better shape than what we're in right now? I don't care if it's physical, spiritual, whatever it is. And the sick man answered, said, Sir, I have no man to put me in the water, or put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying, I, I don't know, if I could just get to the right preacher, everything would be all right. If, if I could just get the right person to lay hands on me, If I just get the right prophecy, how about the last two or three you had? Are you listening to me? Now listen to what Jesus said. Jesus didn't go through no big thing. He just said, Rise, take up your bed and walk. Now, wait a minute. This guy's been 38 years down and out. He totally forgot how to walk. His mind doesn't go there. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. Now, I, I don't want to go into all the other st Jewish stuff, but can you imagine what would happen if we just decided, God, uh, your word, I'm just going to take up my bed and walk. I I I got to I got to go down and finish the uh, the fifth chapter. I'll work on it next week a little bit. But this is what I. I want to challenge, I want to leave you with this challenge tonight. 
find yourself a scripture that you hear God speak to you and say, if you believe this, it'll help you get to your next level in God. All Jesus said to him, said, I'm not going to take you up by the hand. I'm not going to lift you up. All I'm going to tell you is take up your bed and walk. He didn't go through saying you're healed and you bless God. and God. He just said, do it. And the guy got up. I wonder if he got healed into getting up. I've been healed into getting up. Are you listening? And I believe it's available to every one of us. It's, it's, it's as much my need as it is your need. We got to take a word of God that'll take us into the next dimension. Rehearse it until we believe it and rise up and walk. Are you listening? I don't care what it is. I don't care if your need is physical, spiritual, financial, whatever it is. You know, God, you know, you know what? I don't know why I want to talk about money. You know, we you know what we usually think? If we ain't got a nobody's ever got enough money. Especially if you're American. Because you got more wants than you got dough to buy stuff with. But, but here's, here's what we think. Boy, if I could just get a couple hours of overtime and put me over to home. Or if I just get a raise. Or if, you, 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 got, you got what I'm saying? You know what the Lord said? He said, if you'll give, it'll be given to you. Say, well, I don't have enough to give. Give anyway. And I'm not looking for money. We got more money than what the church spends right now. It isn't about the church. It's about you learning how to walk in God and be obedient and trust the voice of God. Amen? 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 Amen. 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 Stand up. I, I'm not finished, but I'm done. What's our challenge tonight? Hear the voice of God. Rehearse the scripture that speaks to us. Believe it. And do it. Father, we just thank you tonight. Thank you for those that gathered tonight. We thank you, Lord, that you'll bless them overly and abundantly, God. Take them beyond their human thinking. Take them over into the mind of Christ. Lord, that they hear your voice. God, they walk in your ways. And they experience your great love toward them. In Jesus' name. And everyone said.